Hi, and good evening, everyone, or good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're joining us from. We're so excited that you have decided to join and spend the next hour with us and author Michael Foley as he discusses his newest best-selling book, Drinking with Your Patron Saints, The Sinner's Guide to Honoring Namesakes and Protectors. My name is Rosemary Eldridge, and I'm the Director of Programs and Communications here at the Catholic Information Center. And before I tell you a little bit more about Michael and share the screen with him, I'd like to encourage you all to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. This way, you can stay up to date on all that the CIC has to offer you, including our daily live stream of Mass, Adoration, and the Rosary. If you have any questions throughout the event, share them with us. You can do this by submitting your question through the YouTube live chat box, or you can email me directly at events at CICDC.org. And if you'd like to purchase today's book, I'd like to encourage you to purchase it through the CIC bookstore. You can do this by emailing me directly at events at CICDC.org or shooting us a direct message on social media. Be sure to include your contact information and we'll reach out and make sure you get a copy of the book. Um, also, before um, the audience uh, question and answering period, we will be announcing our Instagram winner for our Insta Instagram giveaway, so stay tuned. And now, for a little bit more about the person you're here for, Michael Foley. Michael graduated from Boston College with a PhD in systemat Systematic Theology and has been teaching at the Great Text Program at Baylor University since 2004. He has written several quirky books, including Drinking with the Saints, The, the Sinner's Guide to a Holy Happy Hour, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Christianity. He loves teaching and writing and speaking to audiences about a range of topics from theology to film and the art of pious drinking. And with that, I yield the screen to Michael. Hello. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for that kind introduction. I'm still somewhat new to virtual happy hours. I do in general prefer the real thing. I'm sure you do all as well. But one thing I have to warn you about, um, and this is one of the principal reasons for my drinking, is that I do have six children. So this could be a somewhat noisy happy hour. We could get interrupted, but uh, that's family life and that's uh, stay in shelter. Um, but before we get started and talk a little about the uh, drinking books that Rosemary mentioned, uh, we have a rule in my family's uh, house, I learned this from my parents-in-law, that as soon as someone comes in, the first thing you do is you offer them a drink. Then all of the boring stories that you have to share about your house or whatever are a lot more interesting. So before I say anything more, let us pour ourselves a drink. And as you know, there are two featured cocktails for our segment today. The first is the absinthe-minded martini. Uh, in my latest book, Drinking with Your Patron Saints, it is the martini or drink for St. Thomas Aquinas, who is the patron saint of booksellers and apologists, uh, Christian apologists, among other things. And I figured that this is a suitable patron for the Catholic Information Center. So in order to toast to the Catholic Information Center and thank them for this wonderful opportunity to commune, albeit virtually, we're going to have an absent-minded martini and ask for St. Thomas's patronage over CIC. So the ingredients of the absent-minded martini are two ounces of gin, I have a drinking with the saints mixing glass, by the way. Sorry, that is a shameless plug of product placement. Two ounces of gin. And check. One ounce of dry vermouth. Oh, <laughs> my beautiful assistant who's off camera, Alexandra, get the dry vermouth. We have it in the fridge. We like Dolan dry vermouth. But it is, a vermouth technically is a wine, and so after it's opened, it should be refrigerated in order to preserve its freshness. So we're gonna do one ounce of dry vermouth. Now the recipe, the original recipe for the absinthe-minded martini 
calls for lucide superior absinthe, which is a very fine absinthe indeed. An absinthe liqueur obviously is made from anise. It will have a little licorice taste. I just have absente absinthe on hand. So I'm going to pour half an ounce of that. And then a tablespoon of lemon juice. And this last ingredient is a little tricky. It's an ounce and a half of diluted simple syrup. So you take regular simple syrup, you take, uh, you take in, uh, three quarters of an ounce and then you dilute it more with water. So I've done that beforehand and I'm just gonna pour that in right now. I think I got enough. Yes, I did. Nope, oh, here we go. And then we are adding ice. Now the shaken versus stirred controversy will always be raging in our society. But the rule of thumb that I learned and I agree with is that if the recipe has any opaque ingredients such as citric juices, and this one does, you should shake it in order to loosen up those flavors and release them. But if it's only clear liquids, especially where gin is concerned, you should stir it. So a stirred martini in general is preferable because apparently gin is very insecure. And when it is shaken, it is bruised easily. And when it is bruised easily, it grows bitter. So we don't wanna have bitter gin. So in order to protect it, we will stir it. But in this case, because it has lemon juice, the, uh, the recipe does, we need to shake it. So I am going to shake it 40 times, which is the recommended number in drinking with your patron saints. It is a good biblical number of penance, so 40 times. I think that was 40. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And now we're going to put it in a cocktail glass, a drinking with the saints cocktail glass, incidentally. And we'll strain it. And then we will garnish it with a lemon twist. Doesn't that look good? This is a full drink, by the way. That's that's a lot. But that's what the recipe called for. So with the lemon twist, which is right here, we'll tilt it down a little so you can see the drink as well. With the lemon twist, you do want to twist it a little. That releases essential oils, which are good for you. So this is a healthy drink, of course. All right. Well, cheers to the Catholic Information Center and St. Thomas Aquinas. That is good. Would you like to try some of my lovely wife? Well, you shouldn't drink alone. I should introduce my wife because you're not supposed to drink alone. So my beautiful wife, Alexandra, is here stay. with me. <laughs> but I will help us out. Yes, we'll share the cocktail. Cheers, I have to stay somewhat lucid for the rest of the hour, so. I love that one. Yeah, it's not bad. Got the anise. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, thank you, dear. <laughs> So a few words about uh, these books that I have written. Uh, as Rosemary mentioned, I've written three. Drinking with the Saints came out in 2015. And then 2018, Drinking with Saint Nick, which is a holiday book. And then lastly, just last month, Drinking with Your Patron Saints. So with all of these books, the idea is to pair beer, wine, and cocktail suggestions for various saints. With the first two books, the idea was to pair these uh, drink ideas with the various feast days of the church year. So both of these are organized chronologically. You want to look up your birthday or, uh, or just any old day of the week and see what drink or what saint is featured you can do so. So I just happened to randomly pull up July 7th and uh, Feast of St. Cyril and Methodius. They were the apostles to the Slavs. 
and we have a lemon drop martini in their honor. So we have stories of the saints and then coupling with the stories of the saints are specific drink ideas. So drinking with the saints follows the liturgical year. Drinking with Saint Nick also follows the liturgical year, but it's sort of an exploded uh, look at every day of Advent and Christmas season. So it's more detailed about this particular season than drinking with the saints was. But with drinking with your patron saints, we went in a slightly different direction. We're still pairing drink suggestions with the saints, but now uh, it's organized more according to theme, if you will, rather than the liturgical year. The feast days are still mentioned, but the saints are listed alphabetically. We have over 100 saints featured in this book who represent over 700 causes, various uh, reasons for patronage, uh, your ethnicity or nationality, your birthplace, um, your hobbies, your job, your activities, your problems, your ailments, uh, your concerns, all of these are specific reasons to pray to a specific saint. And of course, as I'm sure you know, in the Catholic tradition, we call saints that we pray to for a specific reason our patron saints. And so this will list these 100 saints. The, the first chapter will give you the causes. I list all the causes from A to Z. And you look up a particular cause, abdominal pains, well, then you obviously want to turn to St. Elmo. He is the patron saint of abdominal pains because he was disemboweled during his martyrdom. There is often a very dark connection between the cause and the saint. Uh, you also see a lot of dark humor. Um, the most famous example being St. Lawrence. He was roasted alive on a gridiron and was so tough and so filled with the Holy Spirit that he said to his Roman tormentors, you can turn me over, I'm done on this side. Well, not to be outdone by black humor, uh, the Catholic tradition since named him the patron saint of both cooks and comedians. So that is Saint Lawrence for you. So these are the three books and the Absinthe Minded Martini, which we just enjoyed, and I am continuing to enjoy, is in honor of St. Thomas, who is the patron saint of many causes, students, theologians, universities, uh, apologists and booksellers, as I mentioned, you name it. So um, I would now, according to an agreement with Rosemary, before we move on to the next section, I would like to announce the winner of the Instagram giveaway. But I heard there was a last minute change and I don't know if someone could chat me, chat to me that information. Forgive me, I'm not entirely versed in these new technologies. Ah, here we go. I'm happy to announce that I can use the chat function on Zoom, which enables me to happily announce the winner of the Instagram giveaway. Her name is Cecilia Cervantes. Handle Cecilia Cervantes 7. So, you first six Cecilia Cervantes, you are out of luck, but Cecilia Cervantes number seven, <laughs> this is your lucky day. So you win the Instagram giveaway, congratulations. Oh, yes, cheers. We toast to you and your success. Okay, so at this time, I would like to sort of open the floor to uh, Q&A. And um, I see that I'm already getting an interesting feed um, of questions. So I'm going to sort of hobble around. We got some in a, a Google document and we've got some that are coming in through the webinar chat. So I'm, I'm gonna, my eyes will dart around. It's not a sign that I am inebriated, at least not yet. Um, and I will answer these questions as best I can. So, uh, I'm just going to start with the one that just came in. Is there a patron saint of alcoholics? Are you sure this is an appropriate question right now? 
And if so, what is the cocktail for this saint? Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, those are good questions, actually. And the answer is yes. Um, there are several. And I don't remember them all off the top of my head. Uh, unfortunately, after writing three cocktail books, during the research, some brain cells were destroyed. So my memory isn't quite as sharp as it used to be. But um, St. Monica is the obvious contender. She is the, the patron saint of alcoholics and people with drinking problems. The mother of St. Augustine, uh, according to St. Augustine, had a very, relatively speaking, it was a very minor drinking problem. She was just as a little girl, actually. She was uh, an exuberant child and she liked to see, sneak sips of wine from her family cellar. And so she never really became an alcoholic, but she's associated with uh, drinking uh, problems. And so she is a good saint to pray to. Um, like I said, there are a couple of others, and I'm sure somebody out there knows this, but there was a famous um, Irish lay saint who died in the, in the mid 20th century, who was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever the group in Ireland is called. There's a different name for it in the Republic of Ireland. And he is also uh, a patron saint of alcoholics. Uh, the drink for St. Monica, oh, Venerable Matt Talbot. Wow, my, my beautiful off-screen assistant has just helped me with that, yes. So he's only venerable, but he's, he's still very venerable, so. That means he needs another miracle. So. He needs another miracle, so maybe something to pray you. for, mm -hmm. yes. Um, the drink for St. Monica is uh, a sweet drink called the Merry Widow. Um, she definitely was a widow and she got married after her uh, son, St. Augustine, finally converted to Christianity. So the Mary widow is in honor of St. Monica. Um, the next question I'm being asked is, who is your favorite patron saint? Well, I guess the answer is it depends on what the, what the problem is or what the, the reason for praying is. But obviously the, the, the two top general patron saints are the Blessed Virgin Mary, she has far more patronages than anybody else. But you may be surprised who number two is in terms of number of patronages. Any guesses? I can't hear you. My wife is going to take a guess, yes. St. Christopher. Saint, you think, well, St. Christopher is a very popular patron saint, patron saint of travelers and a lot of other things as well. No, but the, uh, the saint after the Blessed Virgin Mary that has the most patronages is St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas, the future Santa Claus, has just dozens and dozens. I was only able to list a fraction of them in the book, actually, in large part because of the Eastern Orthodox. They have a tremendous devotion to St. Nicholas. Uh, both the Russians and the Greeks named him the patron saint of their navies. He's the patron saint of merchants. He's associated with a lot of maritime causes longshoremen and so forth, and of course his association with gift giving. Um, but for me, my number two is St. Joseph. St. Joseph is the patron of the universal church, and because he's the patron of the universal church, he's the universal patron. That is to say, you can go to him for any reason whatsoever, not just for, you know, St. Joseph the worker or St. Joseph the husband, uh, St. Joseph the protector of the Son of God, but uh, St. Joseph co it covers a lot of different uh, causes. My face, I am proud or perhaps ashamed to admit that we did test the vast majority of those, um, at, at least 75%. Um, but my preferred cocktail is actually the martini. Yeah, uh, it's just simple, elegant. It's called the king of cocktails for a reason. Uh, there's nothing like a simple gin martini. You can use very fine gin. I don't. Um, I can't afford it. But I just have something simple like Gordon's. It's a reputable uh, mid-range gin. I do like using better than average vermouth. I think that makes a difference. And so Dolan, as I mentioned earlier, is a really good vermouth and it really brightens the drink. Uh, let's see what else. Is there a drink for St. Barbara? 
There are many drinks for St. Barbara. St. Barbara has many different patronages. She, be, she is, of course, the, uh, the, the early virgin martyr who was killed by her own father for converting to Christianity. And on his way home from the execution, he was struck dead by a bolt of lightning. And as a result of this fate, Barbara is the patron of anything that goes boom. So she's the patron saint of miners who use explosives. She's the patron saint of artillerymen and cannoneers. Uh, what else should she be the patron saint? She's actually the patron saint of barbiturates because of a strange coincidence. When the German uh, team of scientists discovered barbiturates, they went to go celebrate at a local German tavern. And it turns out the local artillery group was celebrating St. Barbara's name day uh, which happened to be that day, December 4th. And they started buying each other drinks and they said, well, what are you gonna call this new chemical you've discovered? And the guy, the, the scientist didn't know. And so the artillerymen said, name it after St. Barbara. And so they did. And so barbiturates, she's the patron saint of barbiturates. Um, and yes, she has many drinks. Um, there is one called the artillery uh, cocktail, which I've included in the book trying to think what else. Uh, there's an interesting British custom of serving something called a gunfire on St. Stephen's Day, December 26, which also works for St. Barbara. Uh, it consists of a shot of rum in hot tea, hot black tea. Uh, officers serve it to enlisted men in their beds on December 26 in honor of the sort of topsy-turvy days of the 12 days of Christmas. Let's see what else. Uh, what type of wine did Jesus create at the wedding feast of Cana? Good question. All we know is that it was really, really good. But was it white? Was it red? I don't know. I can tell you that I have some Eastern Orthodox friends and um, wine to this day is still made in the region of Cana in the modern uh, nation state of Israel. And that um, among many Orthodox couples, it is a huge uh, treat for them to receive as a gift a bottle of wine from, uh, from that region. So you can actually still, to this day, you can buy Cana wine. St. Martin of Porres is this, the patron saint of public health and interracial love. What is his cocktail? Oh, you're really testing my memory today. I did include him. He was wonderful. He, he, he was a model of racial harmony. He was discriminated against. He was the son of a Spaniard. And was it a Native American, a, 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 a Peruvian, an Incan? I, I can't remember now. Oh, but no, but he was also African. Well, he was the model of interracial love, whatever his, his uh, background was. I do remember what I originally wanted for him, and it was a drink called ebony and ivory. I thought that would be a nice symbol of interracial harmony. But much like the song after it was named, it was really bad. And so <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't include it. Like I, we were doing due diligence with these books and we wanted it to be good. And it really wasn't good. Oh, so what I did shoot, I'm cheating. I'm sorry, I looked at the book. That's why you write things down and publish them. Um, the Pisco Sour. So he's, St. Martin of Porres was from Peru and Peru's most famous contribution to the world of cocktails is the absolutely delicious Pisco Sour. It is made with Peruvian Pisco brandy, which is distilled from, or uh, made from grapes, uh, lemon or lime juice, simple syrup, egg white, uh, which was a common ingredient back in the 1920s, and a dash of Angostura bitters. It's a really outstanding drink. Um, ironically, it was actually made by an American bartender who was living in Lima uh, during the first golden age of cocktails in the 1920s. But it is rightly a drink that uh, redounds to the credit of the people of Peru. So that is why St. Martin of Porres has that. What is the drink for Mary Magdalene? Hmm. Now I can't remember if, I, if Mary Magdalene actually made it into the patron saints book. She's definitely in drinking with the saints. 
We had uh, Mary, the mother of God. We have at least a dozen different titles for her. You know, I'm sorry. I'll have to get back to you on that one. I don't remember the patron, the drink for, the, uh, for Mary Magdalene. I can tell you this though, in addition to serving cocktails, you should always have uh, useless cocktail trivia to regale or bore your guests. I can tell you this much, um, Mary Magdalene's impact on culture. We get the word maudlin for something that is saccharine or overly sentimental from poor Mary Magdalene. Not because of her, but because in the middle ages, she was always portrayed weeping, either weeping at the resurrection or weeping at the feet of our Lord as she, you know, her tears uh, are used to wash the feet of our Lord. Oh, my, my beautiful assistant is telling me I chose a Madeline, Madeline, Madeleine? Madeleine. Madeleine. Madeleine cocktail. Cognac, drambouille, and dry vermouth. So sweet. Bordering on the modeling? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it was her portrayal in Christian art as always well weeping that gave rise to the use of the adjective maudlin um, as uh, something that's a, a little too over the top. Not fair to a great saint. She is the patron saint of penitence and, um, and a wonderful uh, figure from the gospel. Let's see what else we have. I couldn't find the absinthe for the recipe you're using now. Is there a substitute you recommend? I would recommend the absinthe I'm currently using, absente. It, um, it's very good. I, I'm trying to remember, it's got a weird cover of Van Gogh, uh, which alludes to the fact that absinthe was equated or um, connected to madness at the beginning of the 20th century. And Van Gogh, of course, was kind of a, a mad fellow, cut off his ear. And so it was banned by the federal government in 1917 or thereabouts. And only very recently has it been made legal again. At the time, the, the federal government was convinced that absinthe uh, contributed to madness. Oh, here's the original cover. You can see they got a really creepy, surrealistic portrayal of Van Gogh right there. Here's, here's the other side. So they, they banned it because they thought all these artists are drinking absinthe and they're going crazy. Therefore, this is a dangerous drink. What they didn't realize is that it's not that they were drinking absinthe. It's that they were drinking three bottles of it. And three bottles of any hard liquor is going to make you crazy. So it was alcohol poisoning and not absinthe per se, that was the problem. It took the federal government a hundred years to finally realize that it had made a mistake. And now once again, absinthe can be made from its original ingredient, uh, which is wormwood. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I assigned to St. Joseph um, the Sazerac, which is a great New Orleans cocktail, but its signature ingredient besides um, uh, the whiskey and some uh, bitters and simple syrup is a little bit of absinthe. And absinthe is made from wormwood. I thought that was befitting someone whose occupation was carpenter, you know, working with wood. Um, what was Pope Francis's, or what is Pope Francis's favorite cocktail? He's never told me, uh, you know, it's, I don't know why, um, but you may have recently seen a news feed that um, he was filmed last year with a group of Scottish seminarians who gave him a bottle of open single malt scotch whiskey, which is very primo. And he held it up high and jokingly said, this is the real holy water. Oof. You know, <laughs> I say, you know, he's a controversial guy, but I, he was joking with them. I, Cut him some slack. We all miss the holy water a lot. So. Yeah, so now, now that we actually don't have holy water in our stoops or churches to go to, sorry, things can get serious after having one round of the absinthe-minded martini. Um, Saturday is the feast day for St. Mark. What drink should we prepare? Good question. Uh, April 25th is the feast of St. Mark. Uh, there are a lot of drinks associated with cherries for the Feast of St. Mark. In part, that has to do with uh, a, a weird sort of triangular connection between Pope Gregory the Great 
uh, St. Mark's Day, which was a rogation day, uh, when St. Gregory the Great processed on this day, and then cherries. So Gregory the Great liked cherries. He wanted them, there's some weird legend that he wanted them by April 25th, and they miraculously appeared. So we have associated cherries with the Feast of St. Mark. Um, an excellent liqueur from the 19th century that is still around and used in a lot of uh, cocktails, especially around the Prohibition era, is a uh, cherry hearing. It is a sweet reddish liqueur and is quite good. Uh, there is also uh, a little more on the nose, a drink called the St. Mark. And it consists of gin, dry vermouth, cherry hearing, and grosse, which is a red currant syrup. If you can't find that, use grenadine. So that is a refreshing springtime drink. What drink have you been drinking through this COVID time? Anything I can get my hands on, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, for, uh, fortunately here in Waco, Texas, the liquor stores have stayed open. Um, but even if they were shut, I gotta be honest with you, after having researched three cocktail books, I have a very uh, impressive inventory. Um, sometimes, you know, you have to buy a bottle that you're only gonna use twice a year, but you need to use it in order to test the, uh, the cocktail. And so I've got a lot of these sort of half empty bottles. I would like to sort of pare them down, but um, yeah. So what drinks, I, I still try to follow the liturgical year. I still try to follow the patronage. Or you just frankly follow the weather. If it's a warm spring day or, you know, uh, here in Waco, it's already warming up. Uh, yesterday we had a, whi a whiskey smash, which is a delightful 19th century drink, kind of right up there with the mint julep in terms of its qualities of refreshment, but with um, a touch of lemon, uh, which adds a beautiful, bright citrus note to it. Let's see. What else do we have here? Is there a specific drink for Divine Mercy Sunday? And if not, what type of drink would you imagine for this day? Good question. So it's the octave of Easter. And if you really take the, the notion of an octave seriously, that means anything that goes from the previous day, meaning uh, the start of the octave, Easter Sunday, is fair game. And um, I represent, I recommend a number of uh, champagne cocktails for Easter Sunday. I like the way the sparkling wine, you know, the bubbles sort of rising up is evocative of the Christ rising out of the tomb. When Pope Francis visit uh, especially during his early pontificate. You may recall he kept sounding the theme of mercy again and again. And so I did make it, it was kind of like a Manhattan, but with a, a dash of Ferne Branca, which is an art, well, it's an Italian liqueur that's extremely bitter, but the Argentines love it. They've got this Italian-Argentine connection. Of course, Bergoglio was of Italian ancestry who was an Argentine. So I thought Ferne Branca was was a good pairing, um, but it is really bitter. Uh, it's sort of like the interplay between mercy and justice. It, it is a bittersweet cocktail, so it, it's not to everyone's taste. I ended up liking it. My wife, whose uh, judgment I trust entirely, was was less impressed, so they're, they're mixed opinions. Okay. What's the weirdest story you, you, about alcohol and the saints you have ever heard? Hmm. Well, I can say this. Uh, there are several stories apropos of the wedding of Cana, where saints miraculously provided alcohol. So, so sort of the opposite direction of a lot of uh, sort of modern evangelical Christianity. Rather than getting rid of the alcohol, the saints provided it. So you have, the, of course, the example of our Lord and our Lady at Cana, but um, St. Dominic, when his monks were running out of wine, he prayed and the, the, uh, the casks in their cellar filled with wine. 
Um, and there's another saint whose name I've forgotten, but I mentioned him in Drinking with the Saints, that um, they, his monastery had hired a number of workers and they had run out of, of either, I think it was wine or beer, and they felt really bad because the workers were very thirsty and he prayed and miraculously provided them uh, refreshment. Um, so he's not only a great patron saint of providing alcohol, but a great saint of Catholic social justice to make sure to render to the workers their due. Um, and then finally, um, there are a number of saints who are associated with um, the promotion of alcohol, uh, particularly beer. So there are several patron saints of brewers. Two of them are named St. Arnold, uh, depending on whether it's, you're looking at it, a French book or a German book. One is St. Arnold, the other is St. Arnulf, but they are both credited with saving their diocese from the plague by admonishing their flock to drink beer instead of water. As it turns out, this particular plague had waterborne pathogens, so it was safer to drink beer than it was to drink water. And so this is how they were able to save uh, members of their congregation from disease. Oh yeah, so we've got about 20 minutes left. So let me turn to our second cocktail. Uh, speaking of disease, how's that for a nice segue? A couple of weeks ago on the Drinking with the Saints Facebook page, we held a contest. Who can come up with the best cocktail in honor of Saint Corona, who uh, is currently being invoked as the patron saint against the coronavirus and COVID-19. So uh, we ran a contest because needless to say, when, when this book came out in March, I'd never heard of Saint Corona. There are several saints in here that you can, all, you can pray to against plague and contagious disease. Saint Rock, for example, uh, St. Michael, St. Raphael, uh, there are a number of traditional saints that fit that bill, but St. Corona became sort of a new thing. So we needed a drink for her. So we had a contest, every drink was outstanding. It was not an entirely fair contest because I didn't have all of the ingredients. I couldn't find every ingredient I needed here in Waco, which is not the best place in the United States for purchasing alcohol. So it was somewhat unfair because there are a lot of really great candidates that I was not able to vet. But the one that did win and won fair and square was won by Chris Candice called the Old European Corona. And it consists of two ounces of Kilburn Irish whiskey. I will confess to you, I didn't have Kilburn here in Waco, but I did have Irish whiskey, which I'm pouring out of this decanter three quarters of an ounce of Quintus Ruby Red Port. I had to substitute with Dow's. So three quarters of an ounce. Three quarters an ounce of Benedictine liqueur, named of course after the Benedictine order, which pioneered the development of herbal liqueurs in the Middle Ages. Lastly, two dashes of Angostura bitters and two dashes of orange bitters. So here is the Angostura, dash, dash, and the orange. Chris Reppert recommends particular uh, bitters from his native Arizona, which sound very good, but I was not able to purchase them in time. Okay, so now this is, this is pretty clear as far as I can see. So I think we're gonna stir this one. I'm trying to think of the, the shaken versus stirred rule. At least you can see a variety of techniques if I stir it this time. There's no juice, yeah, so that, that's, that counts. All right, so we're gonna stir it with a special stirring spoon. You see how they ergonomically designed it. Maximize your stirring capability. I try to stir 40 times, keeping to the penitential number. Before every Easter treat, there should be a Lent. 
I know if this is, it's harder to stir 40 times than to shake 40 times. You do want it to get good and cold. You don't want to overly water the drink either, but. Then we're going to strain it. Do you have a strain in my love? Excellent. These are cool. The ruby red port brings out an excellent red hue. I don't know if the camera on my laptop is going to do it justice. But it is, oh, there you go. You get some of the color there. See that? So let us pray and toast to a speedy end to COVID-19 and a return to our normal lives. Yeah, let's move. <laughs> My lovely wife will Cheers. corroborate. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> That's good, huh? I just it. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a sign that it's good. <laughs> All right, let's return to some questions. Today is St. George's Day. What is the drink for the day? Good question. There is a good, a very good drink for it today. And I was tempted to include it today, but I wanted a toast to the Catholic Information Center instead. It is, surprise, surprise, called the St. George. And it includes a Hendrix gin, which is a very fine gin. It is very floral and herbal. So for me personally, um, it's got so much personality, I don't put it in a regular martini. It, it needs sort of a special pairing. Um, but the St. George cocktail does a good job of finding the right uh, mixture for a Hendrix. It's a uh, Hendrix, dry vermouth, a dash of lime juice, and three olives stuffed with blue cheese. This is a very nourishing cocktail. Uh, the, uh, the, you can picture sort of the cocktail spear stuffing the, the blue cheese as the sword of or lance of St. George spearing the dragon. We also had someone ask a question, a man named Jorge, whose name day is today. Congratulations, Jorge. I toast to your physical and spiritual health. He asked me what I thought of particular drink that he found in Cornwall, England um, in honor of St. George. And it looked very interesting. It had vodka and grenadine and orange juice and three English strawberries. Don't know how that compares to the local strawberries I get. Um, you know, sometimes, Jorge, I can just look at a, at a recipe and sort of anticipate the flavor profile. That sucker was all over the map. I'm, it may be good, but uh, there were so many ingredients and so many unusual ingredients that you've definitely piqued my interest that looked very intriguing. Um, when was the earliest that whiskey or bourbon was associated with a saint? Here's the interesting thing. Uh, the Roman rituale, the, the, the traditional Roman book of blessings, has several blessings for beer and wine because they were an important part of medieval Catholic life. There are no blessings for whiskey, I'm sad to say. Uh, maybe with the development of doctrine, uh, according to St. John Henry Newman, we will get a blessing for whiskey further down the line. Um, even though whiskey was invented by medieval Irish monks, it was Irish monks who brought the knowledge of distillation to Scotland during their missionary journeys, and eventually, which eventually led, of course, to the development of Scotch whiskey. I am not making this up. The earliest written reference we have to whiskey is in an old Irish monastic document where it prescribes whiskey medicinally as a, quote, cure for paralysis of the tongue. And apparently it works, at least for the Irish. Um, is the pin on your apron from Balcones Distillery? Wow, someone is extremely attentive. Yes, it is. This is a pin. Now, this is my drinking with the saint's apron, by the way. This is a pin from Balcones Distillery, which is an absolutely fantastic maker of fine whiskeys. 
that happens to be here in Waco, Texas. So I know the good folks who are there. They have provided actually several uh, cocktail recipes, the original cocktail recipes uh, in actually all three books, Drinking with the Saints, Drinking with Your Patron Saints, and Drinking with St. Nick. So yes, I am fans of Balcones and it's nice to have them here in town. Oh, let's make up an awesome drink live right now on this webinar. You are creating a drink called the Kneeling Donkey after St. Anthony's Miracle. What do you put in it? Whoa. Now you are putting me on the spot. Why didn't you do this when I was relatively sober? I mean, now I've had two drinks. This could get a little jiggy. Donkey. Donkey. Escriva. Escriva. Yeah. Yeah. So um, St. Jose Maria Escriva, we've, we've got a drink for him in, in Drinking with the Saints. He always called himself a donkey. And he, he compared the work of Opus Dei to the work of a donkey. Just keep your head down. Be humble. Don't get on your high horse. Just do your job. Stay at the water wheel. Um, and, and that's the key to sanctity. And so um, we had a drink called the mangy donkey, because that's what he called himself was the mangy donkey. I, I want to think of, so in honor of that, I will use the brandy that, that he liked, which was a rather cheap Spanish brandy. Like I said, some brain cells were destroyed during the course of research. Um, oh. Lemon? Oh, what was the name of that brandy? Oh, it was, it was fun, Fundator, because it, Opus Dei people call Escriva, you know, the founder, the founder. And he was the founder of Opus Dei, but he, he kind of avoided that title when he was alive. And so anytime anyone called him the founder, he would hold up a bottle of Fundador. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm screwing up the pronunciation. But he would hold up a bottle of the Fundador brandy and say, this is the real founder. And that was his self-deprecating joke. So I'm going to say mangy, mangy donkey fundado brandy for the kneeling donkey. I, I, I haven't forgotten about St. Anthony of Padua. So the story is, if you, the reason why the, the kneeling donkey is that St. Anthony of Padua is the patron saint of those uh, of, of faith in the blessed sacrament. Because the story is that there was this one guy who didn't believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist apparently like sadly the majority of Catholics in the United States, according to a recent poll. So they all need the patronage of St. Anthony of Padua. We all need his patronage. But anyway, this one guy just wouldn't believe it. Anthony pulled out arguments from the church fathers, the medieval doctors, kept pelting him with these solid reasons. Nope, 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 nope. Believe them, and the guys. Said, sure, why not? So, what he did? Okay, so I, I, I just saw that I froze for a bit. So the the challenge is Anthony of Padua challenged this unbelieving man. If your donkey believes in the real, it kneels before the. The, the, the blessed sacrament, will you believe in the real presence? And the guy said, who make things interesting. So he starved his donkey for three days. And when the day came in the piazza, he had next, he had St. Anthony and the blessed sacrament over here. And he had an enormous pile of hay over here. And then he released the donkey. The donkey walks between the two, looks at the hay, goes over to the Blessed Sacrament and kneels down. Mm -hmm. And when the donkey did that, the man did that as well. He believed in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. So, Lemon. bringing us back to the drink. Lemon. I'm thinking Fundado Brandy for the mangy donkey. I'm thinking uh, lemon juice uh, for the initial bitterness of unbelief maybe a little bit of honey, a honey simple syrup for the sweetness of eventual belief. 
and maybe a dash of bitters. Uh, I think we just made a sidecar. <laughs> it's, what, what we're describing is actually pretty similar to a sidecar, but I think that would work, but it's different enough. The, the general rule is that um, for something to be original, this is true in graphic design. I learned this from an artist friend of mine. For something to be original, you have to change a third of it. <laughs> so if you can change a third of a cocktail, you can claim it as your own. Um, so there you go. We did it. We did it. We just invented the kneeling donkey after St. Anthony of Padua's miracle. Yeah. Feeling good. Quantro. Quantro. Oh, wait, my, my beautiful wife off screen is suggesting Quantro as well. No, no, Quantro is in a sidecar. Oh, Quantro is in a sidecar. Right. Yeah, but we'll do the honey simple syrup instead of the Quantro. Yeah. Yeah. It's cheaper. It'll work. And it's, yeah, honey simple syrup is cheaper than buying a bottle of Quantro, which is a great orange liqueur. And if we wanted to add the orange, uh, orange bitters, that's it. Yeah. That's it. So, kneeling donkey. So we're going to get honey and water and heat it up and lemon juice and orange bitters. And I will let you figure out the proportions. Uh, how do you preserve, keep fresh your half bottles that you only use twice a year? Not easy. Like for some things like uh, uh, dry vermouth, sweet vermouth, you have to refrigerate them. Um, there, there's a whole genre of basically cocktail wines, Lille Blanc, uh, Red Dubonnet. Once you open them, you have to refrigerate them. This causes domestic tensions. Yeah, my, my wife wants to chime in on this. I am so glad you asked that question <laughs> because we have six children and we have one refrigerator. And oh, so it seems like the obvious thing would be to have a second refrigerator that you could then put things like Lille Blanc that wasn't like taking up half of your refrigerator space mm -hmm. with all, all the concoctions so he makes. if we had more royalties. <laughs> <laughs> we just need a second fridge. That's all we oh, need. We could buy yeah. it for $100, I bet. Anyway, thank you for your support with that question. I think that's going <laughs> to cinch the deal with Mike. Absolutely. Um, and also for the non-refrigerated, um, just keep it out of the sun. That's why a lot of bottles, for example, have a dark color. It's to protect them from sunlight. UV rays can be bad, like, like the absinthe right here, right? So you just, you keep it out of the sun. The, the only um, liquor or liqueur improves after being opened is chartreuse, hmm. which is just an absolutely magical word. Or it's, it was invented. Um, it's only made one place in the world in near their house in the French Alps. It consists of over 130 hand-picked herbs. Oh, I think I cut out again. I got a little message saying my internet connection was unstable, so I don't know where you last heard me, but Chartreuse is magical. It is... Uh, it is one of the greatest products of Catholic civilization. And um, it, is the, it is a rare liquor that actually gets better even after it's been oxidized. Uh, okay, final question. Oh yeah, and I also recommend, thanks to my wife's helpful prompting, uh, Chartreuse is great neat. It is very potent. It's like 110 proof. Uh, but, um, a last word cocktail contains a little bit of chartreuse and gin and lemon juice, and it's fantastic. Okay, one more question, and then we're going to hand things back to our hosts. Uh, do you have a cocktail for the protection against Lucifer and the snares of the devil? Um, the obvious answer is yes, I have one for St. Michael the Archangel, and it is called the St. Michael's Sword. It is a drinking with the saints original. Um, every one of three books contains tried and true traditional recipes, but also original contributions. And the St. Michael's sword is one of them. It consists of Jim Bean, Devil's Cut Bourbon. 
So in whiskey distillation, the uh, especially with the angel's share is the term used for the uh, bourbon that is lost during the distillation process. You know, the, the heat builds up in the casks and it evaporates. And so it, it, it goes out of, out of the air and into the ether and that is called uh, the angel's share. The devil's cut on the other hand is the amount of whiskey that is lost to the wood casks because as the whiskey is aging, a bit, you know, a small portion of that you know, uh, fluid, that liquid, will seep into the uh, the wood and be lost. Well, Jim Beam claims that it has pulled that cut back from the devil. It somehow has ex extracted the liquid from the wood, and now it's extra rich and extra intense. And it is actually a pretty darn good bourbon. So we so Saint Michael deserves uh, to the victor go the spoils and. So so if something has been stolen from the devil, St. Michael deserves it. So uh, Jim Beam, devil, Devil's Bourbon, uh, orders, and finally, um, Blackberry Brandy, which uh, ties into an old Irish legend that St. Michael threw Lucifer onto a blackberry bush when he drove him out of heaven. So St. Michael's sword is what I recommend uh, for protection against Lucifer and the snares of the devil. Well, I'm going to turn things back to Rosemary. Uh, and I want to thank you all for spending this hour with me. I, I hope it wasn't uh, terribly boring. And um, Rosemary, I hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was so fun. You are definitely very knowledgeable about cocktails and saints. Um, and as you mentioned in your talk, you should be. You've written three books on them. Um, thank you, audience, for your great, great questions and for joining us for this event. Be sure to share the event with your family and your colleagues um, and your friends. They deserve to know about these fabulous cocktails and the beautiful and wonderful saints that inspired them just as much as you do. And don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social media, and we hope you can make it to our next event, um, which is going to be on May 7th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, this event is Theology of Home, Finding the Eternal in the Everyday. Um, during this live stream YouTube event, Carrie Gress and Noelle Marie will share behind the cover secrets on making of this book, um, offer insights on the many domestic and career details that women face every day, and of course, extensively answer your questions. Um, and finally, um, um, Michael, thank you again. That was a wonderful kneeling donkey cocktail that you and your wife um, put together on the fly. We're going to have to be sure to share that um, on our social media and on our listserv um, so that everyone can enjoy one. And thank you again so much for uh, joining and have a wonderful rest of your evening.